and um, I think uh, so this has been covered rather in detail in lectures and uh, I think there's enough of a hint that uh, it, you can do it on your own. So of the other um, kind of simpler questions, let me just do the three just so that I can demonstrate that it's simple. <laughs> so, you know, all, all this day, again, deal with the efficiency. And I guess the part that might um, make it, that could make it unexpectedly not simple is if, uh, um, you know, if you kind of uh, missed some discussion of efficiency, because what I want to make sure you got is how we define efficiency in a very general sense. Um, in a very general sense, how we define it is kind of what we want in the numerator and what we pay in the denominator. So kind of that's the that's not even thermodynamics definition of efficiency. That's just the efficiency that's applicable in general to everything. Um, in the thermodynamics sense, with the heat engine, there's a very specific thing that we want, which is the net work done. So net work done over one cycle is uh, goes on the numerator for efficiency, and what we pay this takes some kind of thinking through that what the lecture was covering. And uh, when you go through all that thinking through, I hope you come to the conclusion that what we really pay is the heat transfer in at the high temperature reservoir. It's not the net heat transfer because um, when you consider the heat engine cycle, the heat that you transfer out at the low temperature reservoir is a kind of a waste heat. So uh, when we return that heat to the environment, we didn't really uh, give anything back. That's kind of, that's a waste that we are trying to get rid of. So we only count the heat input from the high temperature reservoir. So once you understand this uh, definition of general definition of efficiency for heat engine and from the first law and the understanding of cyclic processes, you understand that net work done is simply the difference of the heat transfer, then the, once you get that conceptually, then the rest is kind of simple. Um, so, you know, for this question, it says, it gives you the heat input and it tells you the efficiency. So the work done must be, um, so 480 times 0 0.19, 91.2 joules. And once you have that, then okay, um, from this here, the heat, trans heat discharged uh, must be the heat input minus the work done. So 388.8, probably close enough. <laughs> so yeah, and that's kind of the questions of one through eight are all kind of like that. Um, now, when you get to the uh, coefficient of performance, there is a slight bit of um, modification, but the general idea remains the same. The slight bit of modification, so it goes to the question of what is it that we want, you know, what we want. And the um, slight bit of changes, when you are dealing with a refrigerator, then, um, then you know you are not uh, looking for refrigerator to do uh, to produce mechanical work. You actually provide the mechanical work to the refrigerator. So oh, that actually gives us um, what we pay. So with the re refrigerator, what we pay is the um, uh, the network that you have to put into the refrigerator refrigerator to get it to do the work, do the thing that it does. And what we are trying to get out of refrigerator is actually this removal of heat from the cold reservoir. So, the, so from this uh, basic definition of efficiency, uh, this is the expression that everyone agrees should be reasonable for a refrigerator. Um, uh, how much heat is removed that from the low temperature reservoir, that's what we want, and how much work, mechanical work we have to do to that accomplish that. So uh, this expression still holds valid, and uh, very oftentimes with the refrigerator, this can be greater than 100%. Uh, 
So that's why we call it coefficient of performance, because it kind of feels weird to say something has greater than 100% efficiency. Um, so yeah, so we do for a refrigerator, so you make that modification to the definition of efficiency, and then you just to work through. So it has uh, removes that, discharges that. Oh, so I need to figure out the network done. The difference is 170. So 170 is the amount of work that I had to put in. So calculating that coefficient, it should be um, 300. That's the kind of result we accomplished. 300 joule removed from the cold reservoir divided by amount of work we had to put in. So that 1.76, that's the coefficient of performance. It's uh, the figure of merit. Uh, so, you know, we don't put it in percentage terms because it kind of doesn't make sense to talk about percentage terms. And work per cycle, that is the difference there. So 170. That seems a little bit backward kind of asking, but whatever. Um, so it's a... Uh, um, all these questions one through eight, they are kind of simple, this type of questions. There are some nuances, um, as in when you get to talking about uh, heat pump. Uh, so heat pump, heat pump has a different definition of coefficient of performance than refrigerator. And it does come down to, yeah, I talk about that here, um, because it comes down to what you want is different between the two. So um, yeah, so that's heat pump. And I think, uh, and, and I want you to just do one of the entropy questions just as an illustration of the formula. Um, let's see. Yeah, I guess I can do this one. That's a slightly more complicated than this one. So, you know, this one, it's uh, quite simple. You just, uh, uh, it's, literal application, direct application of the formula for reversible or quasi-static processes, change in entropy of any system or thing is the net heat input into the thing or system divide the temper divided by the temperature of the thing that it was at when the transfer occurred. And here, all the kind of numbers are given. So, um, so you do have to be careful if it's uh, removed from heat reservoir, then you want to make sure your entropy change of the, for the reservoir is negative. I think that's why I say mind the signs. So that's rather simple. It takes a little bit more thinking through and work uh, here because it looks as though the question didn't give you the amount of heat transfer. But if you read it carefully, that it's isothermal um, and that it gives you the amount of work, it actually has given you all the information you need. You just have to remember that the first law of thermodynamics, change in internal energy is heat transfer minus work done by the system. If it's isothermal, then temperature didn't change. So the uh, change of internal energy is zero. So that quickly gives you that heat transfer is the amount of work done by the system. So if uh, ideal gas is doing this much work, there must be Q in that's uh, equal to that so that it's isothermal. So then it goes back to applying this formula. So let me do that. Uh, heat transfer, it's a plus 21 joule, oops, um, plus 21 joule divided by uh, the temperature in Kelvin. So it's uh, 11, uh, 11 plus 273. So 0 0.0739 uh, joule per Kelvin, that is the change of entropy, uh, 0 0.0739. So that, that's it. Um, so yeah, so that's a problem set five. <laughs> and once again, this is uh, kind of why we had a week three, because if uh, we were just going by uh, questions in the textbook, I thought it was a little bit too simple for engineering physics. Um, and you know, the way the thermodynamics is covered, I think that simple coverage, it's fine. If uh, you do a more lightweight work on thermodynamics, it doesn't hurt you at all for the remainder of your physics education. So that's fine. But you know, as long as we are committed to spending four weeks on thermodynamics, I want you to do something that felt more engineering than just plugging numbers into formulas.